Hello everyone, I'm Alan Joaquim with the Sons of History. Well, you know that old saying, when the cat's away, in this case, Dustin is away. He uh, unfortunately won't be able to join us, so I will be hosting this show. And uh, as I always like to do during my other shows, I like to uh, have a cocktail and I invite you to join me in enjoying a cocktail so we can talk a little history and have a little bit of fun. Mm. So, uh, now the unfortunate thing... <clears throat> Man, that stuff is harsh. The unfortunate thing is I can't really smoke this cigar in here because it's going to stink up my home and stink up my books. And also, I can't really see because I'm now practically blind. So I'm going to put on my regular glasses. But you can still indulge in a little bit of a, a, little bit of a drink. So, well, we hope you enjoy today's uh, broadcast. We are going to be interviewing a, a, a judge on the Michigan Court of Appeals. Uh, his name is uh, Mark Boonstra. Uh, he has written a couple of books, and uh, we have a uh, he has a third one coming out here pretty soon. He's already written a two volume out of a three volume work. So we we're going to talk to him about history and about the state of affairs in the United States right now. Uh, but before we get to that interview, uh, we would just want to say uh, thank you for watching us and. Uh, uh, if you would like, we would appreciate it if you go to our YouTube channel and subscribe to us. Uh, that way you'll get notifications. Uh, if you could like us on Facebook, follow us on Instagram. And we are also on the Epic Times uh, TV show. It's called Epoch TV. So, uh, um, you know, if you, are, if you are a subscriber to the Epic Times, you can, you can watch our broadcast on, on their TV channel. We have a road trip documentary that uh, we have released. Um, Dustin and I went to um, uh, Fredericksburg in Denison, Texas, where uh, General Dwight D. Eisenhower and uh, Admiral Chester Nimitz were both born, two Texas natives who led the way during the Second World War. So we do have that documentary. Now, we also have another documentary that I am working on myself. Uh, it's about the Gulf Coast campaign during the Revolutionary War. Uh, when uh, Spain was involved, um, General Bernardo de Galvez uh, led the way and kicked the British out of British West Florida. So uh, we were fortunate to score a couple of interviews. Uh, one of them, uh, Kenneth Ramagost, who uh, discovered where a, a particular fort in Baton Rouge was located. Um, Mike Bunn, who wrote the book The Fourteenth Colony. And we have Wesley Odom who wrote a book on the siege of Pensacola. This one's called Pensacola, the Longest Siege of the American Revolution. Uh, he was kind enough to show us all around the city where a lot of events took place. So we will have that, uh, hopefully we'll have that video broadcast sooner rather than later. So, And we also have uh, gear. If you would like some gear, if you visit our, uh, we have our own website, www.thesonsofhistory.com. You know, lots of gear, Christmas is coming up, Hanukkah. A um, bunch of other holidays. So uh, anyway, so all right. So what we're going to discuss first is this week in history. OK, so this week in history, Dustin again is not here, so it's just going to be me. And we are going to talk about the Battle of Hastings Part 2, which took place on October the 14th of 1066. Now, a couple weeks ago, I did mention the landing, but this time we're going to talk about what happened after the landing. Um, William the Conqueror, who was the Duke of Normandy, uh, believed that he had a claim to the throne, the English throne, when Edward the Confessor died in January of 1066. Now, uh, William and Edward the Confessor were cousins, and William did visit in 1051, and he was, according to Norman sources, he was promised uh, the kingdom. So, but when he died, uh, Harold Godwinson, who was the Earl of Wessex, um, he claimed the throne himself. Uh, but, you know, he, got, he was challenged by his own brother, Tostig, and he was also challenged by uh, Harold Hardrada of Norway. Now, they had a big battle on September the 25th. Yeah, sounds like my neighbors are going to be caving in. Uh, on September the 25th, the Battle of Stamford Bridge, in which Tostig and Harold Hardrada were both killed. Now, a couple days later, on the 28th, was when William the Conqueror landed in Pevensey, which is on the south coast of England, and he advanced to Hastings immediately afterward. Well, 
Harold Godwinson was already on his way heading south when he heard about the invasion. And so he went to the Hastings area to meet up with William the Conqueror and to challenge him. And there was a battle there, and that was on October the 14th. Again, this was in the year 1066. So it was an all-day battle. It started in the morning and ended at dusk. And it was really a decisive battle. Um, Harold Godwinson was shot in the eye, and he died. And his two brothers also were killed in the battle. And the English forces were scattered. Uh, Now, there's no reliable source as to how many men were on each side. They've ranged from... About you know five to seven thousand to the low side, up to twelve to thirteen thousand to the high side, and that and that's on both sides. Um, uh, Harold Godwinson took more of a defensive position, but um, you know William won the day. He won the battle again. You know Harold Godwinson was shot in the eye. He died, and then he kept going into the country. And uh, you know there were a lot of other other men that challenged. Uh, Harold, but I'm sorry, challenged William, but he won the day and he became the king. Um, had a wrote something called the the Domesday Book, which was kind of an inventory of the people living in the country and the and uh, so the Domesday Book very important. Uh, the Bayou Tapestry. If you're ever in uh, in Normandy, go to the town of Bayou and you'll see the Bayou Tapestry. Um, it it tells the story of uh, William and and the Battle of Hastings. And, uh, you know, I've got neighbors upstairs that are just pounding the ceiling. You can probably hear them right now. Anyway, so um, now, why is this important? Well, the British royal family, you know, King Charles III, all those guys, they can trace their ancestry all the way to William the Conqueror. Um, Now, there were a couple of, you know, alternate routes here and there, especially when... uh, you know, King George I came into the picture. But overall, they do trace their ancestry all the way back to William the Conqueror. So, very important battle, very important event, and that took place on October the 15th of 1066. And that is This Week in History. Okay, let's get to the interview. We think you're going to really enjoy this. Um, We do have uh, uh, Mark Boonstra, who is a judge with the Michigan Court of Appeals. He has uh, uh, written two of three books. He has a three-volume work uh, called In Their Own Words. It's about the Founding Fathers and their work, their very own words about religion and America. Um, you know, like I said, it's a study of the Founding Fathers and what they think of the current status of uh, United States. You know, we'll talk about his thoughts on the history of the country, the current, the country's current state, and, you know, where we go from here. So, um, without further ado, let's talk to Judge Mark Boonstra. All right, everybody, thank you for joining us, and we want to thank uh, Judge Mark Boonstra, who is here on the fun- who's here on the line with us. Uh, how are you doing, Judge? I'm doing well. Thanks for having me, and please call me Mark. Okay, Mark. Uh, just call me Alan. So, uh, thank you for thank you for joining us, and we uh, we we appreciate uh, you taking the time to sit and talk to us about some really important issues that's going on in this country right now. Uh, so much so that uh, you know that you've uh, written a couple of books, and I believe there's going to be a third one coming out pretty soon. Because uh, uh, everything I read was that you have a uh, it's a th- three volume work on the words of the founding fathers uh, regarding this country and uh, and religion i'm assuming that that's what the uh what the gist of the of the topic is but um before we talk about your book um let's talk about what's going on and what you think is going on in this in this country right now you're on the michigan court of appeals and uh you've you've come across a couple of cases where you've you've practically been targeted by some of the uh the woke crowd some of the left um what what are your thoughts on on what is going on with the country where we're headed and uh, you know wanted to hear your wanted to hear your side of the story? Well, generally, I think the country's in trouble and it's been uh, increasingly in trouble for a long time and that's really what what compelled me to write this book. It's something I've been working on uh, for for honestly for eight years um, and um, as you said, volumes one and two are out. Volume three is in the process of coming out. It'll be out very soon. 
Uh, I didn't really intend it to be three volumes, uh, but, um, and I'm not sure I fully appreciated the scope of what I was taking on when I started it, but there are 118 people that I've covered in these books and it turned out when it came time to publish, I had to divide it up into volumes. So that's what I've done. Um, what I say in the book is our founding fathers must be rolling over in their graves, looking at what we have done to the country they gave to us. Uh, and uh, I concluded long ago that we had strayed so far from what they intended us to be as a country in so many ways that it compelled me to try to help right the ship a little bit, do what I could uh, in that regard, to let people know exactly who these people were who founded our country and what they believed about religion and its place in our society. And religion was fundamental. The belief in a supreme being and the need for his guidance and direction was fundamental to the founding of this country. It was the essence of why they came here and why they founded this country. And I was concerned that we had lost that. And that has led fundamentally to, to all of the things you see in modern day society, where we're becoming secularized in every aspect of our society. Uh, so I'm concerned, I think they would be aghast looking at what we've done to the country they bequeathed to us. And that's why I wrote the book. Uh, I, about the cases, you asked me about the cases. I don't know that I wanna get into too many specifics, but I guess it comes with the territory. You know, I'm in some sense, I suppose, a public figure. I have a public office. Uh, the book isn't about that really though, other than to the extent it kind of a form, informs my view of things. But yes, they've attacked me in a couple of instances. And uh, I guess that comes with the territory. It's, it's sad to see, but it is what it is. Well, I got to give you kudos on one of the cases. Uh, it had to do with a, um, a guy that was growing weed and, and a couple of thieves broke into his home. And what I, one of the things that I noticed was the way you, you judged that particular case was you looked at how the law was written, not so much how you felt, you know, there was, I, I sensed that you were against the activism part that a lot of judges embrace. And you said, look, this is what the law said, but it's the, it's the Congress, the Michigan Congress that needs to change the wording because this guy, although, you know, we don't agree that he was sentenced as a sex offender, um, the law states it and we need to it's the legislature that needs to change the wording, not us. I try to approach every case that way. You know, if I wanted to make policy, I would have run for the legislature or run for governor. Uh, that's not what judges are supposed to do. The people elect their representatives to the legislature. They make policy and we interpret the law. Uh, sometimes that's necessary. Sometimes the legislature's words aren't as clear as they could be and we then have to apply it in new settings but you try to apply the law as it was written by the people's policymaking representatives. And, you know, it's a problem. Sometimes uh, judges, um, you know, see themselves as, um, as um, super, legislate, super legislators and they see a policy objective that they want. And sadly, sometimes they start at the end and work their way back rationally. And that's really not what we're supposed to do. We're supposed to take the law as it is, apply the facts, and get to the result, whatever it is. Well, I, I, I agree wholeheartedly, and I wish uh, many members of the judicial branch would, would uh, follow that, uh, that thinking. All right, so now we're going to talk about your book. And now you and I are pretty much in agreement on what your books say. So... To make this interesting, I'm going to play devil's advocate. So um, I was going to have a little bit of uh, cake vodka, you know, to be the devil's food cake. And then I decided I'm going to have a little bit of Jim Beam fire because I think that's as close as we're going to get to playing devil's advocate. I didn't have uh, Jim Beam's devil's cut, but I'm going to be enjoying a drink here while we talk, if you're okay with that. <laughs> so, All right. So let's start with this is what. If somebody who opposes your point of view or just has a question, they're going to say, what about the Establishment Clause, the separation of church and state, um, the Church of Danbury, Thomas Jefferson, uh, First Amendment, 
How, how would you address questions such as that? Let me give a little bit of background first, if I could, because what I was trying to do in this book was not really to put forth my own positions about anything. Um, I was really trying to put forth the founding fathers' views of things and let people judge for themselves because people may not care what my opinion is, and that's fine, but they should, should care about what our founding fathers said and believed. And that's why the title of the book is in their own words. I tried to give not only biographical information about all 118 signers of our three founding documents from a religious perspective, who they were and where they came from, from a religious perspective, but quotations, what they said in their own words, in speeches, in proclamations, diary entries, letters, you name it, what they said about religion and its place in our society. And then I contrast it with one example from modern day America and ask the reader to answer for themselves, what would George Washington, Thomas Jefferson, whomever, think of where we are today? Uh, the Establishment Clause, well, it, it, was, it was certainly necessary at the time, you know, when they founded this country and they were establishing colonies, a lot of them brought over what they, what they came from, which is Massachusetts was established as a congregational colony. Virginia was, Epis was Anglican, Church of England, and it was the established church. And people were um, penalized, and, um, uh, and it was unlawful to, um, uh, to not follow the dictates of that church, and they were taxed to support a particular church. I think ultimately, uh, the founders agreed and they came together and they said, you know, we don't want that. That's what we came from. We don't want that. We want freedom of religion. We all believe in religion. We believe we should promote religion. And most of them were Protestant Christians of, of various denominations, but, and some of them wanted to sort of restrict it to that. But ultimately it was, it was agreed. There will be no established church. We need an establishment clause that pre pre prevents the Anglican church or the Congregational church or whatever it is from being an official church, but we will allow all religions freedom uh, to exercise. Everyone can exercise their religion as they see fit. And part of that is because uh, the founders recognized and their writings are replete with references to our liberties coming from God. Um, and um, and, and part of that is people being able to decide for themselves, being free to decide for themselves what they believe and how to worship. Okay, so now I know that when the Constitution was written, nine of the 13 states had established churches. So then what you're saying is that they didn't want an official Church of England, Church of America, coming out of what was known as the general government before it was called the federal government. So would you say that that's, that pretty much was what they were referring to? Because taking off my devil's advocate hat, I have looked at it as, as more of a partnership, that it wasn't a theocracy, it was a partnership um, that, you know, the Christian religion, um, and, and I want to be careful when I say that, because uh, although... According to this guy here, Alexis, now, God, I always butcher his name, Alexis de Tocqueville, I can't say it in French, de Tocqueville, um, almost everybody, almost everybody was a Christian, how you rate the, you know, between Orthodox and Deism, um, that's up for debate, but um, everybody was a, was a Christian, there were practically no known atheists, there were some um, there were some Jews, a very small amount, but um, again, I'm not playing devil's advocate here, but I saw it as kind of a partnership between the, um, the two sides because I re recall, and you may confirm this, that uh, Adams and Jefferson, I'm sorry, Adams and Benjamin Franklin, John Adams and Benjamin Franklin all said that um, we, we need to be a disciplined people, a religious people for this republic to work, for freedom to work. Certainly they did, and, uh, and so many of them talked about how uh, the government and our society is founded on virtue and morality, and what was the underpinning of morality? It was religion. 
and um, uh, so they were they were very much almost I think to a to to a person in varying degrees, but to a person they were Christian and they believed fundamentally in a supreme being, and in the and in and, and that our government and society. Uh, needed to rely upon that in moving forward. Um, I do think, I guess, it, it was a partnership. And, I, and, I, and, and, and today we, we talk about separation of church and state and we make it appear antagonistic. It wasn't at all. And, and what Jefferson talked about when he wrote that letter to the Danbury Baptists, he was responding to a letter of theirs that they were concerned because Baptists had been persecuted in certain colonies, including his colony of Virginia. And, uh, and they wanted assurance that they would be able to practice as they wished. And he said, yes, absolutely, uh, uh, you should be able to do that. There's a wall of separation. What he was not trying to say, if you look at his words in the context of what he said, he was not trying to say we need to protect the government and society from religion. He was saying we need to protect churches from interference by the government so they're free everyone is free to worship as they see fit that's what the wall of separation was intended to be well i know that in the constitution the uh, words in the year of our lord is in there i i did i did kind of notice that one so but um let's let's just declaration we're endowed by our creator with unalienable yep. rights that's jefferson right he's the one they so often point to as a supposedly a deist and secular. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and he's a complicated guy. He's, uh, and he's in volume three. So I, I actually have, uh, have uh, studied him fairly recently and, and you'll see that coming out in volume three. But I, I kind of, uh, I'll give you a little brief preview. I kind of refer to him as, uh, as the intellectual of his time in good ways and bad ways. He was very smart, very educated. Um, very rational, um, but I think it also gave him, as we see so often even today, a little bit of intellectual hubris in the sense that if he couldn't reason his way to an understanding of something, he maybe discounted it. And so he discounted some things that you and I maybe accept in, in Christianity because he couldn't himself reason his way to it perhaps failing to recognize the inherent limitations of the, of the human capacity. But in any event, he was, he was very much a Christian. Um, was he a deist? Well, I, I would say he was a deist in the sense that he defined what a deist was. And he defined a deist as someone who believes in one, his quote, his words, one only God. Okay, in that sense he was, but he was very much a Christian. Uh, he, uh, uh, his, his father was a member of the vestry. He was a member of the vestry for many, many years. He, he formed his own church, recruiting uh, Reverend Charles Clay from his St. Anne's Anglican Church uh, to preach at the new church he founded, the Calvinistical Reformed Church. Um, and it lasted for about seven years and only then uh, uh, sort of dissipated because the founders all moved away. Jefferson went to France. Um, to the day he died, he referred to himself as a member of the flock of Reverend Frederick Hatch's church in Charlottesville, Virginia, who he paid as the tutor of his grandchildren. Um, so was he a deist in the sense that he believed in one only God, his words, I suppose he was, uh, but he was also very much a Christian. Okay, so I've, from what I have read, I've always uh, looked at someone like Ethan Allen, and, um, oh God, you know, this is what I hate when, when words, uh, the, the, Thomas Paine, you know, when you get into your 50s, you start forgetting names and all that, but uh, I know that Thomas Paine and Ethan Allen, I would, I would call them about as pure a deist as you could find, and then you had the Orthodox Christians, uh, Sam Adams uh, is a big example. So, what a lot of people don't know the difference between, say, a uh, deist and an orthodox Christian and everything, everyone that was in between, like uh, John and Abigail Adams. Um, what what was the difference? What uh, who who was where? What someone's asking you? What's the difference? What uh, how would you uh, how would you approach that? Well, I don't know how much I want to go there because um, uh, pain, for example, is not in the book, uh, uh, and. Uh, 
neither of those you mentioned are in the, in the book. So I haven't really studied them the way I have the other 118 people who did sign our documents. Um, I, I guess I would just say the two that I hear spoken of most often as deists who were among the signers who I have studied and who are discussed in this book are Jefferson, who we just discussed, and Benjamin Franklin. Um, Franklin, as a young 18-year-old, did say he was a deist. Um, and um, I'm not sure what he meant by that. I think it's something that, it's a term that's thrown out, but isn't ever very well defined, right? Um, but uh, he was also a very religious man. He didn't, um, when he attended church, which he did a lot, it was mostly the First Presbyterian, First Presbyterian Church of Philadelphia. But there were indeed times when he wasn't particularly enamored with whoever the minister was at the time. Um, so what he did is he created his own liturgy. And it's in the book. The entire text of his liturgy is in the book. And he would follow his own liturgy and his own private worship services when he wasn't attending church. And in his older and wiser days, he said of his more youthful 18-year-old comment about being a deist, and this isn't reported <laughs> much, uh, it was one of the great errata of my life, he said. One of his biggest mistakes in life was to have declared himself to be a deist. Uh, among the 118, those are the two I think that people point to as supposedly deists. Even they were Christians. Jefferson, a little bit unorthodox, admittedly. Um, but uh, all of them, uh, to varying degrees, were, uh, were, were, were Christians. Okay, so now the title of your books are in their own words. So do you have some examples that, uh, that you would like to share uh, with our audience? Sure. Let me give you a couple that I've pulled out for, uh, for uh, volume three. Um, Father of our country, George Washington, said, quote, of all the dispositions and habits which lead to political prosperity, religion and morality are indispensable supports. And let us with caution indulge the supposition that morality can be maintained without religion. Another one from volume three is Richard Henry Lee. Uh, there are two Lees in the book, both from Virginia, Richard Henry Lee and his younger brother, Francis Lightfoot Lee, who they called Frank when he was growing up. Um, they both signed the Declaration and the Articles of Confederation, I believe. Um, and Richard Henry Lee, although Jefferson gets the credit for drafting the Declaration of Independence, Richard Henry Lee is the person who on June 7th of 1776 authored the resolution in the Continental Congress to declare us to be free and independent states. That's what led to the formation of a committee that Jefferson was put on, frankly, as a compromise candidate. They left Lee off and uh, the, uh, the other alternative that was discussed was Benjamin Harrison. Uh, and Jefferson was kind of a compromise, but that's what led to the drafting of the Declaration of Independence and its ultimate adoption. And that, that, was, that was the resolution that was voted on on July 2nd, correct? That was the, res well, actually, uh, yes, I think that's right. I, and, and by then they had been working on the drafting of the Declaration itself, yes. But Richard Henry Lee, who authored that resolution said, uh, refiners may weave as fine a web of reason as they please, but the experience of all times shows religion to be the guardian of morals, and he must be a very inattentive observer in our country who does not see that avarice is accomplishing the destruction of religion or want of a legal obligation to contribute something to its support. He, like Patrick Henry, favored actually taxing citizens to support a church, but not an official established church, the church of their choosing. But the reason was because they believed religion so important and so fundamental to our society that they thought it appropriate. And George Washington didn't oppose that either. Yeah, I think I think Sam, Samuel Adams is one of uh, that's he's one of my favorites, and uh, I know a lot of people like him for obvious reasons. But uh. let's do two more then. Samuel Adams, who was the father of democracy, Sammy the Maltster, they call him. His family came from the brewing business, but he was a true firebrand, a real revolutionary. 
He said, the religion and public liberty of a people are intimately connected. Their interests are interwoven. They cannot subsist separately, and therefore they rise and fall together. For this reason, it is always observable that those who are combined to destroy the people's liberties practice every art to poison their morals. And I think that's a lot of what you see going on in our country today. We're poisoning the morals and we're undermining uh, the fundamental underpinnings of our society. Um, let me give you one more Benjamin Rush. And I, I say this because it's about education. I mean, look what we've done in our schools. We've taken God out of the schools. You can't, can't speak of God. I mean, some of the examples in the book, in the books are, are about, you know, uh, uh, the school sending the sheriff to a parent. This is in the John Adams chapter sending the sheriff to the parents' home because the child had, had shared a Bible verse at school. And, and first they had talked to the parents and they said, okay, we won't do that. And then the child did it off campus grounds and the school complained and they said, okay, we won't do that either. They still sent the sheriff to their home to intimidate them. Um, but Benjamin Rush, who is the founder of American Medicine uh, said this, the only foundation for a useful education in a republic is to be laid in religion. Without this, there can be no virtue, and without virtue, there can be no liberty, and liberty is the object and life of all Republican governments. Um, but look where we are today. What would Benjamin Rush think? He'd, he would be rolling over in his grave. Where, I mean, where do you think our country is headed right now? Because, yeah, I mean, like, you, you know, we had a... Um, uh, we had a Dr. Uh, Joe Wolverton um, on our show a couple weeks ago, and we discussed how the Supreme Court took it upon themselves to start, you know, trying religion cases like uh, uh, prayer in school. And uh, you know, I grew up. I grew up in the '70s, and you know, we had prayer before every game, before every uh, commencement, graduation, and no one, no one thought twice about it. it was just like, yeah that's just the way it is and then you know one of the things we discussed was how it, it was never meant to be a part of the federal government it was a state issue and it was supposed to be tried by state courts but now you know we had i would say just in the 60s alone we had more cases with the supreme court regarding religion and in, in school than say the previous you know, 150, 60 some years of the, uh, of the Republic. And now, you know, since then we've had, I mean, it seems like cases have just uh, either doubled or, you know, the, the ratio just kept getting higher and higher. Um, how do you see, because I, I see them as they're trying to purge religion, which in my opinion, and I know you agree that that's not what was intended. Wh how, what, you being a judge, what do you see? What do you see the future of our country? Yeah, well, I'm worried about the future of our country. That's why I wrote the book. Uh, but, um, you know, I guess it remains to be seen what the Supreme Court today will do with these issues. Uh, I hope they do something to set us back on the right path. Um, but you see what happens when they issue decisions that some in our country don't like is they're threatened. They're, uh, you know, people go to their homes and, uh, and, and threaten them in that fashion. It's I mean, that's frightening. That is not what this country is meant to be. Um, I, I will share this with you. Um, uh, volume three, as I said, is about to come out. Uh, and uh, I have a foreword that's been written for that book. It's by a, a friend of mine. Um, his name is Stephen Markman. He's a, a now retired chief justice, former chief justice of the Michigan Supreme Court, constitutional scholar. He teaches constitutional law at Hillsdale College. And one of the points he makes in the foreword is that a lot of this um, drift towards secularism has occurred in the last 75 years or so, and it's been enabled by the Supreme Court over those years. Uh, so, I mean, there were old, old Supreme Court decisions that said we are a Christian nation. Um, uh, I was just reading today, Charles Coatsworth Pinckney is in volume three. He's a signer of the Constitution. He studied and took four volumes of notes from William Blackstone in, over in England when he studied law over there. And, uh, and, and one of the things that came through in that was that Blackstone said that uh, Christianity is part of the common law. Um, 
the courts in recent years in this country would no longer say that, would they? But English common law, uh, Blackstone being one of the most eminent uh, scholar, legal scholars of that day, uh, said that Christianity was fundamentally part of our common law. I, I think, you know, I think we have to see where it goes, but I think, um, I think we're at a crossroads. And I think, uh, you know, we're in danger of losing our country. Uh, if it's not late already to save it, it's time for people to stand up and say, we're not going to let you do this to our country. And I'll share with you my, my new introduction for volume three, the very beginning, I say, we are in, quote, in a battle for the soul of this nation, unquote. So declared the president of the United States in a recent speech at Independence Hall in Philadelphia. That just happened. And I say, he is right. The question for you, the American people, to answer is, quote, who is on the Lord's side? And that's Exodus 32, 26. I think that's the question the American people have to think about. Um, do, 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 who is on the Lord's side in this progression of our country from a fundamentally Christian and faithful nation to a secular nation that has banished God uh, from every corner of our society? I, I think I know the answer to that. But obviously, it's a question that everybody has to answer for themselves. I just hope they answer it correctly and in time to save our country. Well, you know, I have a, I have a lot of friends who are uh, liberals, from liberals to the left. And, you know, when I have these discussions with them, some of the things they like to say is, oh, you want a Christian theocracy or the danger of Sharia law if, if uh, a certain region of the country— uh, not so much has Muslims, because I've never, I, I don't really don't know too many Muslims who want Sharia law. They, they, they embrace the Constitution, but you're still going to have some fundamentalists who will, who will embrace Sharia law, which runs counter with our Constitution. So, I mean, what are your thoughts about people who sit and argue about a Christian theocracy or, or Sharia? Well, I don't know anyone who wants a theocracy, Christian or otherwise. Um, this country isn't that, it wasn't intended to be that either, uh, in the sense that there is no established church and people are free to worship or not worship as they see fit. Those freedoms are fundamental to who, who we are. Um, but, um, you know, I think, um, I, I think uh, our society suffers, however, when we lose uh, when we lose the benefits of religion and the, the, the morality that uh, that religion underlies. Uh, Sharia, uh, you know, I, I don't know anyone who's in favor of Sharia law, but I guess I would say, um, uh, and I want to be a little careful, because as, as a judge, you take cases as they come, right? And you need to study the arguments. And to be fair, I would want to study the arguments before I, I expounded, you know, in broad principles. Uh, but I guess I would say this, that uh, the Constitution is the fundamental law of this land. And to the extent that um, uh, something is inconsistent with the fundamental law of the land, it has to give way. And if Sharia uh, is inconsistent with the fundamental uh, law of our Constitution, then I suppose it would be one of those things that would have to give way. I, I know some Christian fundamentalists, and I, you know, I know uh, quite a few Muslims, and I know, you know none of them. They're at least the ones I became friends with, they're all for the Constitution. So I've never, that's never been a concern of mine, but it's brought up every single time. So, all right, now before we, we conclude this conversation, is there is anything that you feel is important that needs to be brought up or that you'd like to, um, you know, say regarding the country or your books or about yourself? Well, as I said, I think the country's in trouble. This is my you know, modest effort to try to help wake people up. I think need to, pe people need to wake up to what's going on in this country. Um, you know, I think, I, think, I think it's easy to be complacent. Um, we've had, we, we know nothing other than this free country that our founders gave to us. Um, and we don't know what it's like to live under tyranny. Uh, but I think we're seeing threats of tyranny on the horizon and the loss of our freedoms. You see it uh, all around you today. Um, and I think people need to uh, wake up and say, it's, 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 it's time to stop the drift and it's time to go back 
to the, the uh, foundational principles of this society uh, as it was given to us by our, by our founders. It's lasted for 250 years. It has been the greatest nation in the history of the world for a reason, and we're, we're losing that. Um, so this is my small effort to help, I guess, wake people up. I would encourage people, um, um, you know, it's been said that this is a book that um, needs to be in every church, every school, every home. Um, people need to, and it's, and it's not because I wrote it, it's because it's because it is a resource to educate people uh, in the face of um, uh, in the face of our our educational system, journalism in America, entertainment in America being taken over by the secularists uh, who want to discard God from our society. Uh, this is a resource to educate people as to the truth, as to who our founding fathers were, as to what they believed, as to what they envisioned for this country, and uh, to use that to reassess where we are and let everyone answer that for themselves. But it's, it's a tool to give them information, to uh, educate them to truth and reality, and give them a basis on which to assess that and hopefully right the ship uh, of this country. Well, I do want, I, I want to thank you, not just for being on this show and, uh, you know, discussing some of your thoughts, but I also want to thank you for, you know, being a fighter for the Constitution, being a fighter for our country, because, it, you know, how many people would uh, take up the cause of liberty? Uh, I, I would put you on that list for sure. And, you know, we, we are grateful to you. And, um, you know, we thank you. We hope uh, we can have you on the show again uh, after the uh, the third volume comes out. Um, we enjoyed the conversation. I'll, I'll tell you that. And so, uh, and I'm look, like I said, I'm looking forward to the uh, third volume. Thank you for saying all that, Alan. I, I it was on my heart to do this, and I just felt that I it, I needed to I needed to put it out there for people. Um, I guess I, I don't want to forget to uh, let people where to know let people know where to find it. There is a website for the book. It's called foundersownwords.com. There are direct links on that website to uh, the publisher, Liberty Hill Publishing, which is my preferred place to get the book simply because they don't keep quite as much of the proceeds, uh, but also to Amazon and Barnes and Noble. And I would encourage everyone to, uh, to take a look. Okay. Yeah. I know, I, I know you're on Amazon because I started following you. So <laughs> hey, thank, well, you. thank you so much. Appreciate it. And, uh, you know, we hope. Uh, oh, by, by the way, when will the third volume come out? So it'll be out before Christmas. It's in typesetting right now. I'm in the process of, uh, of sending my comments on the first typeset version. So it'll be out well before Christmas. All right. Well, there you go. So now, you know, everybody, uh, if you uh, need a Christmas or a Hanukkah gift, uh, uh, you can start doing your shopping now. So, all right, Your Honor, thank you so much. We enjoyed it, and uh, we wish you all the best. Thank right, you thank so, you much. so much. Okay, folks, I hope you enjoyed that. That was a uh, that was an incredible interview. Um, you know, I really like what the guy had to say. He he made some very good points, and he he used facts, the things that were written, things that were spoken by the founding fathers. You know, I can't tell you how many arguments and debates I've had with people who want to have some sort of a, you know, divorce between religion and, you know, our government, our country, which was not what was intended by the founding fathers. You know, they didn't want us to be a theocracy. They didn't want us to have a, a you know, Church of America. But, that, but, you know, everybody back in those days was religious in some way. Um, you know, Alexis D. Tocqueville, who wrote... Um, you know, one of those books that I mentioned, which I don't seem to have around me right now. But, up oh, here we go, right here. Um, Democracy in America, if you ever get a chance to read this book. Um, you know, he talks about the fact that, you know, everywhere he went in the United States, you know, everybody, everybody was religious to some extent. Um, majority of people were Protestant. And, it, you know, it was, it was a given. That's just the way things were. People... Um, you know, it, it was a given that you do, you do things a certain way. Um, the people, yeah, that yes, they had their faults, but America was pretty much, you know, ruled by, you know, moral principles and, you know, 
many of our founding fathers that I knew of felt that we needed religion, we needed a religious people, we needed a disciplined people in order for the republic to work because, you know, you train your son, you train your daughter to be an adult, you train your son to be a man so that when he turns 18 or 21, you know, he has now has all this freedom. Um, now, what he does with that freedom, you hope that the principles that you have taught him will will guide him and, and make him a good person and make him a responsible man. So, and same thing with the ladies. So, um, you know, that, that was pretty much, in my opinion, an opinion of other people and even the words of the Founding Fathers, that that's where our country was headed. And, you know, we didn't want a theocracy. We did not want it. You know, the federal government, the general government, as they called it, they didn't want, you know, a, a Church of America. Now, the states, nine of the 13 states did have their own churches, but... Um, you know, this country was founded so that anybody who comes here can practice their religion any way they see fit without any type of persecution whatsoever. So, all right. So, um, he has, uh, again, um, uh, Judge Boonstra has a uh, has two books that are already released. A third one will be released around Christmas time. It's a three-volume work, um, and it's called In Their Own Words. It's the, it's the very words of the Founding Fathers. So, you know, get it, read it, learn it, know it because we need it. Anyway, all right, so let's move on to our book and movie recommendations. All right, so I'm going to do movie first. And actually, you know what? I'll do book first. The book is obviously going to be uh, Mark Boonstra's books, uh, in their own words, volume one through three. Now, again... Volume one and two are out. Three will be coming out soon. But, you know, Christmas is coming up. Uh, Hanukkah is coming up. You know, Kwanzaa is coming up. All these religions are coming up. All these uh, Saturnalia, whatever. Uh, winter solstice uh, makes a perfect gift. Learn it, like I said. and Because uh, God knows we need it right now. So that is going to be my book recommendation. Now, movie recommendation is called The Railway Man. Now, this stars... Colin Firth, Nicole Kidman, and uh, Stellan Skarsgård. Uh, you've, you've seen Stellan Stars, Skarsgård on, on many movies. And, of course, Nicole Kidman. Everybody knows her, uh, former Mrs. Tom Cruise. But uh, Colin Firth, um, now, he portrays a guy by the name of Eric Lomax. Now, Eric was captured uh, during the Battle of Singapore in 1942 by the Japanese and if you are a fan of Bridge on the River Kwai, you know about the, uh, the slave labor that the Japanese imposed on, on captured prisoners uh, from, from the war. Um, yeah, Bridge on the River Kwai, you know, it's, it's a fictionalized account. But, but this one is a little bit more, um, yeah, more realistic. Yeah, granted, I know there's no, there are no Americans in this movie. There's uh, no Steve McQueen jumping... Uh, Jumping the hills with his uh, motorcycle. Uh, this has, it's an English story, but it's a great story. And it's a story about forgiveness. Um, I'm not going to tell you what happened. You got to watch the movie. It's, it's a good movie. It's a very powerful movie. But it's, um, you know, Eric Lomax, this is a true story. Eric Lomax has uh, to fight his demons. And it has to do with how he was treated during the Second World War. And it's a story of forgiveness. And believe me, this is a... Just watch it, and you'll know what I'm talking about. So, anyway, so that those are the books and the movies that I recommend. All right, folks. Well, our show comes to an end. Um, you know, we are on um, we are on Epoch TV, Facebook, Instagram, YouTube. Uh, we have our own website, www.thesonsofhistory. Uh, watch us. Uh, we we do hope that you enjoyed this interview. We hope to. Uh, uh, have uh, Judge Boonstra back uh, on the show when we when he uh, does his third uh, when he, when he releases his third volume. Uh, but we thank you for being on us on the show. Um, I'm going to take one last gulp because when Dustin does the show next week, I know he's not going to permit me from having a cocktail. So, but have one. Enjoy yourselves. Have a good night, have a good weekend, and God bless you all. Again, I'm Alan Joaquin with the Sons of History. Thank you very much.